Sometimes, a maritime disaster can become so infamous that it takes on a life of its own. The burning of the P.S. General Slocum is one such story that has been immortalized again and again in literature, television, and movies. But with each dramatic retelling, some details are bound to get lost. Even if the sinking remains one of New York's worst waterway tragedies, it is worth examining the true nature of what happened that fatal day to ensure that the lives of all the people on board do not become a trope in narrative storytelling. The single-cylinder General Slocum was a feat of wooden ship. With her boilers and side wheel offering a pressure of 52 pounds per square inch, she had a sturdy momentum that made her perfect for sunny cruises along the waterways of Manhattan. On 15th June 1904, she was boarded mostly by women and children for a close-knit German community. It was the end of school, so members from St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church met in a large group for their annual outing. Children wore their Sunday school outfits. Women waved flags and carried babes in their arms. The men, fathers and husbands, were away working and in their place was a German band playing on deck. By all accounts, the morning was a joyous romp filled with singing and laughter. However, below deck, things were a different story. Cabins and storerooms were filled with machinery and oil barrels used to refill lamps. The constantly reshuffling of crew quarters created a lax atmosphere of complacency and cutting corners. Not only had oil been spilled all over the deck of the lamp room, but it was used habitually by staff who used open flames, either in lamps or cigarettes. One of the crew, a deckhand, reported to Captain William Van Schaik that nearly a thousand tickets had been collected. However, children under 10 went free, adding a further 300 to the toll. But when including the crew and catering staff, the number of people on board rose to 1,350. By the end of that morning, only 300 or so would still be alive. Throughout her lifetime, the P.S. General Slocum had experienced a number of mishaps. Just four months after her launch in 1891, the vessel, named after the Civil War general and New York Congressman Henry Warner Slocum, ran aground off Rockway. Eventually, tugboats freed her from the inlet, but they'd be back again when she grounded just off Coney Island during a storm. It seemed everywhere she went she had problems. She once struck a sandbar, cutting her electrical generator. She collided with the tug R.T. Sayer. She collided with the Amelia, this time with 900 drunk anarchists from New Jersey who started a riot in an attempt to seize control of the ship. Then, once more, in 1902, she ran aground, forcing passengers to camp out overnight until she could be freed. She had been around for just over a decade but was garnering a lot of bad luck and bad press, but somehow the owners and operators bounced back. Whatever they did, it was enough not to deter the residents of Little Germany, who picked their boat to continue their right for the 18th consecutive year. In fact, in the lead up to the trip to the Locust Groove picnic site in Long Island, a fire inspector had deemed it fire equipment to be in fine working order. This would soon prove to be otherwise. Trouble started when some of the lower deck crew noticed puffs of smoke rising through the wooden floorboards. Immediately, they ran below to the second cabin and grabbed the hoses, but the rotten fabric bursts. Though there were hand pumps and buckets on board, the untrained men were startled and ran above deck, claiming it was like trying to put out hell itself. The crew had not participated in a fire drill for a year. In fact, it did not appear as if the crew had ever had any adequate fire training whatsoever. Subsequent investigations determined that although the captain was ultimately responsible for the safety of its passengers, the owners had made no effort to maintain or replace the boat's safety equipment. The fire was believed to have come from the forward cabin or the lamp room. No one was sure. It has long been believed that a discarded match or cigarette was the catalyst, but there was no time to investigate the origin as the fire quickly reached straw, oily rags, and the displaced lamp oil. By 10 a.m. of that morning, the first fire notice had gone out. Eyewitnesses claimed the fire began in various locations, one such example being a paint locker filled with flammable liquids and a gasoline-filled cabin. A 12-year-old boy had tried to warn Captain Van Schaik but he was not believed. Ten minutes later, though, the captain had no reason to doubt. Onlookers from Manhattan could see the fire and smoke and shouted for the captain to dock immediately. First, he aimed for a small pier, but was warned off lest he set a blaze to the lumber stored there. So now, he piloted for North Brother Island, 
one mile away in the hope of beaching the ship sideways to enable people to get off. But with the speed, coupled with a fresh wind, fanned the flames. Panicked mothers scrambled for their children. Passengers hurled themselves overboard, despite being unable to swim and being weighed down by the thick cotton cloth of the period. The life jackets that the crew distributed were also rotten, and mothers reported putting them on their children, throwing them to the water only to look in their horror as their offspring sank under the water. Even the lifeboats were either tangled, inaccessible, or stuck to walls from dried paint. The atmosphere on board was a fever pitch. Children were trampled upon as everyone tried to flee. One man, covered in flames, flung himself over the side but was swallowed by the giant paddle. One account has a young boy shimmying up the flagstaff and hanging until the heat was too great before he had no choice but to plummet into the flames below. Though nearby ships were scrambling to retrieve survivors, they found themselves wading through bobbing corpses or children. Then the middle deck, succumbing to heat, burning, and the weight of huddled terrified passengers, collapsed. This in turn caused the outer rails to jolt and sent women and children overboard into the choppy waters. One woman gave birth and jumped into the waters with her newborn, but neither surfaced. As the ship neared the island, workers at the Riverside Hospital, known for housing patients with contagious diseases like typhoid, spotted the burning vessel and readied their pumps and fire hoses. Even the island's fire whistle blew to summon dozens of rescuers to the shore, just as Captain Von Schaik, his own feet blistering from the heat, managed to ground the boat sideways, some 25 feet from the water's edge. Though hospital staff and rescuers threw life rafts or swam to save people, the intense heat prevented anyone from getting closer enough to the ship. The P.S. General Slocum became engulfed in flames from stern to stern. She remained on the beach for around 90 minutes before breaking free, drifting eastward and sinking in shallow water just off the Bronx. Bodies were stretched out on blankets on the island's lawn and sand, most being women, one still clutching her lifeless baby. The children that had survived were now orphans and milled about the beach in a daze. Most of the 300 to 400 or so survivors were rescued by two tugboats that had arrived swiftly once the Slocum beached. One miraculous survival was one of a 10-month-old baby who floated to the shore unharmed and a young boy who managed to swim through the flailing, panicked passengers to safety. The last person believed to leave the ship was Captain Von Schaik, who was now blinded and crippled. He would be sentenced to 10 years for his negligence. By comparison, the parent company would pay a relatively small fine even though there was evidence of falsified inspection records. Eight people in total were indicted by a federal grand jury. The captain, two inspectors, and the president, secretary, treasurer, and commodore of the Knickerbocker Steamship Company. Though only the captain was convicted, he was pardoned on Christmas Day just three or so years later. The end result of the controversial court case was that it motivated federal and state regulations to improve emergency equipment on passenger ships. But what was the legacy on the victims and their families? The community of Little Germany has been in decline before the disaster. The loss of so many families sped up its dissolution. Eventually, they moved away, and their church converted into a synagogue when Jewish immigrants arrived to settle. In 1906, a marble memorial fountain was erected in the north-central part of Tompkins Square Park, and the sunken remains of General Slocum were salvaged. It is clear now why this tragic, dramatic tale has been retold again and again, for it is a story of corruption and catastrophe as much as it is a tale of survival and scandal. However, one question remains. With some fingers being pointed, which person was mostly to blame? Let us know in the comments below. If you'd like to have more videos exposing maritime scandals, then please leave a like, and be sure to share this with anyone interested in New York history. Lastly, don't forget to subscribe for our next video. Thank you for watching.